the common Okay, I'm Gregor Kaiser from Germany and I'm working on issues like uh, seeds and uh, gene technology and um, somehow I guess the, the concept of open source can be applied on seeds and how, or is, is it will be better to speak of um, protected commons. So that's my main focus of work. Okay, my name is Soma and um, I work with a group in South Rajasthan in Western India that is uh, currently trying to strengthen community-based organizations to claim forest rights in the co and to uh, incorporate gender issues more effectively within that struggle. My name is Camila, I'm from Brazil and I've been working mainly with the forest issues uh, with a new frame uh, coming along with uh, the green economy proposals in my country that refer to the natural capital and how this entails in a threat to the commons and the proposals to resist it. Okay, I'm Justin and I work with forest people in Central Africa supporting them to regain their rights to their land. And I also work in Scotland, um, both in the land reform movement and in the transition from oil movement in cities. So in the session today, we discussed three questions, and I want to understand whether we arrived at some interesting conclusions in the session for these three questions. So one is this issue of what is the law or the norm-based rules that govern your particular commons? Maybe we can start with Justin and, and move down. Okay, so the group I was in was looking at air, and that there aren't norms that govern that global commons of the air. And obviously the air is connected to land and fire in terms of energy use and water and so on. So we were moving towards, or I felt we were moving towards looking at how do we establish a global governance of that global co commons um, in a way that is done in a commons way. So it's not imposing some structure from above, but it develops through local commons connecting with each other and supporting each other to secure their own commons, which is the way of solving the climate crisis, to no longer be reducing the CO2 and pouring it into the atmosphere. So finding subsistence and need meeting patterns where you are. So that's kind of a clear solution. But on the other hand, you also need a fast transition, given where we are, given we've only got a few years, if we may well have gone past it, but if we haven't gone past it, we've got just a few years. So we need some other kind of form of governance there too, and governments and corporations have clearly been incapable, had no interest or whatever been captured by the fossil fuel lobbies. So looking at how do you scale across between commons, how do you actually develop a movement that really has a grounding in the locality, but a focus on the, on the global in that way. And my interest in that is partly how do you recapture the state, uh, that I think the state gets misses, missed out of when you're thinking about global and local, thinking about corporations, thinking about commodities and so on. Often the state gets missed out and the state's power is what enforces a supposedly free market. So how can you recapture the imagination of people that there's a positive hope because the work I do in Africa only works when people have hope and that's the first thing that you're bringing is some sense that actually you can regain your rights or you can protect your rights and once hope's there then everything becomes possible but without that nothing does. So there's something about how the stories and experiences of the commons can link with each other and we were looking at and want to carry on tomorrow looking at how do you make exchanges between whether it's through film or whether it's through people going and experiencing and if it's through film then how do you how can you experience through film rather than be just pictured as a head speaking you know how can how can people interact with other landscapes in that way and with other people's experience so how could that really work that people can get a really embodied sense of what's happening elsewhere and be inspired by that and supported by that and then how do you scale that across so that, that allows for kind of a recapture of the national state level and the work I do involves using international law using international human rights, international media, to uh, bring a focus when there's a real struggle on the ground. You use that story, that experience, the reality for people, and you bring this international level. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to shift the national level. You're trying to actually shift the laws and actually get the 
get the legal system, get the political system to accept the, the rights of people on the ground. And that strategy seems to work. It seems to be quite a good shift. So how can we do that around climate in that way? The subject I have been more into in, over the last three years is a major change in the Brazilian forest code. And this has turned it into, uh, the issue has turned it into a campaign that was able to mobilize the entire Brazilian society. It was the most, the change in the forest code became the highest politicized agenda of an, over an environmental issue uh, over the last, let's say, decade or maybe two decades in Brazil. Because it touches directly on private property and the uh, land structure of Brazil. Brazil, since the colonial times, has the country it has the, mo uh, the most concentrated uh, land structure. I mean, you have the least people with the largest pieces of land than any other country. Just second Paraguay, where the Brazilians are the major landowners. So what, what, is, what, what was at stake? We have a constitutional rise to the commons in Brazil, for Brazil. But the commons, being the forest, the air, the fresh water, they rely on the environment. And once almost, you know, the vast majority of our country is private property, the land is privately owned, the Brazilian Forest Code uh, determines that a percentage of a private property is a legal reserve. It's something that you can own property, but you cannot touch as you will. This, for example, is something non-existent in the United States. Once you own property, property is absolute right over what you want. In Brazil, this, this was not true. So this was a historical agenda that the agribusiness interest and the big landowners wanted to change because they kept comparing that the expansion of Brazilian agribusiness uh, only could be done if you could open more, clear more land but this land was illegal to the forest. And they keep pointing that, for example, Europe does not have such thing as a legal reserve. So this is why agriculture in Europe, of course, more than the subsidies, uh, it's more competitive. So they keep pointing the, compar the comparisons with other countries to dismantle a protection. And the Brazilian society, uh, especially rural movements, uh, urban, urban youth started to mobilize in the internet and created this big snowball around the change of the forest code. Finally, uh, the agribusiness lobby won, the changes were made in the forest code and now we have lost, I mean our commons are more under threat mm. and we lost the, uh, the forest code protection. But in exchange for that, because it was also uh, a political loss for the Brazilian government, they proposed a green package, incentives for positive behavior uh, f uh, regarding to the environment. And this uh, is much in the line, as I referred before, of what is the co at the core of the green economy. So uh, we can, instead of having and a constitutional or legal or a norm-based protection for the commons, you reverse and you throw over the individuals uh, the charge of behaving well and then receiving incentives that are economic incentives for, for such behavior. And this, because this gives you or you the chance of earning your own money if you behave good, uh, uh, a erosion of former common uh, um, of a, a common uh, approach to protecting that resource. So what we are witnessing in Brazil and what we're facing and resisting, uh, it's this changing in mindset because it can sound as a very uh, technical or a very um, modernized approach of ecological economics, some call it, but at the end, regarding of how society behaves, it's, strong, it's throwing upon the individuals the decision of how to behave based on what they individually will profit or will gain out of it. So I think this for me um, uh, was quite uh, uh, was a very strong experience over the last years in discussing with the colleagues in the group. That I was also in the air group. Uh, we're trying to think the contradictions of this narrative that uh, it would be good to have a global atmospheric commons or something like that, when actually the climate it's much more driven by the land, what's happening down there in the land where the people can 
can have or have not the management and, and the power over the resources because the climate, after all, is an abstraction of uh, ecological relations that are done on the ground and that depend on the, uh, on the, on the political power that are exer exerted on, over the territory. And in the case of Brazil, in the case of the Amazon, uh, with life threats, with paramilitaries, with uh, forced evictions, I mean, uh, we would love to be here and to bring very positive narratives on the commons and very cheerful. Uh, but actually, I feel much more in my uh, working experience in the pressing of, of a land that has been uh, grabbed uh, year after year and that, after all, will finish because once you have all private land, and like this is the run for the final enclosure of those territories and contracts are being signed. So I would like to see some balance of this very positive narrative that we're hear hearing here with the forcing, um, uh, condi the, 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 the push from the reality on the ground uh, and the timing that this is imposing over us, you know, because then commons is not an intellectual option or acting that we can start, uh, you know, doing with uh, uh, in such a light way. But there are uh, in yeah, it's life and death. It's it's it becomes like a life and death, you know. And I think this this tone, uh, I would like to see it more present. As for the seeds, mm -hmm. that is also the monocultures and the dis disappearance, you know. It's something we are losing time on this. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I, I just want to make two comments yeah. about what you said. So, so one, I think it's really interesting to note the the role of the state because we're usually focusing on multinational corporations, mm -hmm. but the state is equally as involved in the enclosure of the commons. And I mean, you know, Lula's government mm -hmm. in Brazil is much celebrated in a way, and is a kind of emblematic of the governments that have been able to push out you know, Western imperialist, the, the IMF structural adjustment programs, which we know has a history in Argentina. But yet Brazil is really held out as a kind of model for, you know, the real, real popular sovereignty. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the state is still pursuing these kinds of uh, development projects. And so the logic of development is much stronger towards, as uh, Marie Stella Svampa called it, uh, neo-extractivism, mm -hmm. and so it's a new phase in which the state is equally a partner with, with multinational companies, not because they are just making money and just because there's a lot of bad people who are corrupt, but because of the very fault, the faulty logic of development, of constant growth, you know, of the idea mm -hmm. that we must constantly expand. So th this, is, this, this is just one thing. And then the other is that you know, then how you said land, you know, land is connected to air. So the climate problem is, is tied to what we're doing on the land. Right? As above, so below. It's, exactly. And so I think it's really important, and I'm really trying in our group to make sure that although we've split into these different groups, mm -hmm. air, water, and land, that we really converge because all of these issues mm -hmm. are so interconnected. So. We don't want to steal more time. Let's go to, let's go to uh, Soma. Would you answer the question about the, the governance? Uh, yeah. Um, in the specific context of forests in the region where I work, there's a history of legislation that has uh, related to the forest. But even prior to that, there are the customary rights that communities have and the customary systems, customary law by which the um, forest resources are managed. And that system has been is centuries old. Communities live by their code. They know how to manage that. They know that the systems are uh, catered to a particular rhythm of their lives, catered to a particular context. And that customary tradition has been respected for so many centuries by those communities living there. And then post-independence, we've had a whole series of enactments which the first set of enactments actually which I'll talk about is the Forest Conservation Act, which actually uh, even prior to independence, it empowered the forest department to establish its domain over all the forests in the country. So what it did really was superimpose an institutional arrangement that enabled the empire, the British government, to rule over the forests, while, even while the customary law prevailed for the tribal people and their 
system. So there was a plurality there and there was a dominant paradigm established over a customary paradigm yeah, for the purposes of extraction, etc. Post-independence, that has only got reinforced with the state and its uh, authority through the forest department in um, uh, actually fencing off the forests into the control of the forest department. So the Forest Conservation Act and the 1980 legislation actually uh, declared forest dwellers, traditional forest dwellers, as encro encroachers into their own forests. Now, on the one hand, what this did was, uh, for women on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'll speak about the women's issue, because the customary law did not acknowledge women and their presence as the transactors of all kinds of relationships, the embedders of all kinds of relationships in the forest. But the customary law did not acknowledge them in the justice delivery systems. There were The forums of governance did not uh, uh, for instance, give women a space, nor did the uh, women have a say in the decision-making processes of how the forest and the relationship with the forest or the local governance should in fact be managed. It was only through an informal system of informed oral discussion that they were able to make some inroads into that practice. But what has happened now is in this duality, uh, the customary systems have really got, gotten kind of subverted and the constitutional processes of the forest conservation law from the government has really superimposed itself. Um, so we have the forest department claiming forests which are the forests of the traditional forest dwellers. And on top of that, the forest dwellers are primarily tribal. And uh, we have new legislation, progressive legislation, that the people's movements have been lobbying for. And we have a history of people's movements in the tribal areas, even in the times when they, com they uh, protested and resisted the British intrusion into forest areas. In the east of India, this happened much more effectively. In the regions where I'm working, it was, uh, there was also movements to protect the forest regions by the tribals from intrusions by others. But uh, that kind of resistance and um, people's own mobilization has led to two very significant um, legislations. One is the PISA Act, which is really a provision for the extension of um, democratic self-determination in the tribal areas. It's a system of democratized decentralization of governance acknowledging the sovereignty of tribal communities in the regions where they have lived for centuries. So it's, uh, it's emerged out of the movement of tribal people for a um, kind of, um, I'm thinking of the Hindi word, for uh, claiming what they have had as a tradition of governance over the centuries. So um, on top of that, we have another, this was a legislation that was passed in 1996 at the central government level, but never really got translated into, an act, into rules and notifications that could be implemented. Because the uh, fact is that there was, there's been a resistance from state parties to actually making this happen, because it means that it is actually going to push back on the authority of state agency over the tribal people. And the fact that they have a right in their regions means that they cannot be called encroachers. You know, now we have another set of legislation that became necessary so that people could actually con uh, continue to work and live in the areas where they've been for so long, which is called the Forest Rights Act. It has a longer title, but uh, generically called the Forest Rights Act, which came into being in 2006 as a, as a consequence of a huge amount of mobilization and agitation primarily led and drafted by the Campaign for Survival and Dignity, uh, which uh, led to this draft being declared, uh, de being discussed across the forums that exist for um, um, as assertion of tribal people's rights. And when this um, draft was discussed, there was a whole process of discussion to and fro, okay, this is okay, this is not. Because what happens is there's a conflict within the Constitution itself, which acknowledges individual rights. Uh, 
And the communities that we are talking about, the tribal communities, are talking about community rights. So bringing that into the legislation and transacting that with the state became quite challenging. And there are um, uh, people like Madhusarin, uh, Pradeep Prabhu, etc., who were uh, facilitating this whole discussion were at the front end, brought these issues into the domain of how people themselves are the traditional uh, occupants of those regions. And it is a injustice, it is a historical injustice that has been done to them by displacing them from the very regions where they have been original dwellers. So the law is in place. It has uh, two kind of uh, very important provisions. One is that individual claims be given to people who can establish that they have been in that region for a period of time. The period of time is also specified, and not only for tribal forest dwellers, but for non-tribal forest dwellers as well, as long as they can establish that they are forest dwellers and dependent on the forest. Um, the other thing that it provides for is for community rights, which means that there is a region where the community itself subsists from, interacts with which has been the more difficult part to transact with the state because the resistance to actually allocating these claims, recognizing them, despite all the mapping, all the efforts that have gone in, um, community claims have only been given in a few instances. And that too for things like schools and for uh, water stand posts and for sacred um, places, etc. The actual definition or understanding of what community claims means is totally absent right now with the state and the allocating agency. The, uh, the, apart from these, I won't go into the details of these. Can you say one thing about the community rights? You know, yeah. This is, I mean, it, it's actually quite an advance of what has happened in the examples that you gave because actually in the West, the notion of collective rights is completely rejected. Yeah. And in fact, this was very much part of the legal apparatus that was uh, um, pursued throughout the, the colonial project, right, in India as well as in Latin America, uh, to impose the, um, the idea of individual rights. Mm -hmm. And human rights instruments still continue to use to talk the, about the, the language of individual rights, which right. really has no place in the, in, in, in the common struggles, because they are collective struggles. Yeah. So there really, have to, I mean, there, there really needs to be a huge evolution in the law to recognize yeah. that actually collectives have rights which cannot be uh, communicated through through uh, the, this legal standing recognition of yeah. one individual, yeah. but there's very little progress in this direction, and I think that you know this is something we can learn from the examples that you're giving. It's well. a very significant <coughs> move, one to uh, for the law itself in its preamble to say that this law is to correct a historical injustice. That was a huge battle, and it was a very significant uh, move. The other was about actually acknowledging that community rights can and must be acknowledged, you know, because it has been there for so long. And the PISA enactment also gave that space. So these are very significant people-driven, movement-driven initiatives that have allowed um, these rights to be claimed. But the fact is that there's much to be done in terms of actually claiming the community rights. We have a few examples that it has happened. There has been assertions and there have been co cooperative administrative people also who have seen the sense of allowing this to happen. So those states now become examples. For instance, in Maharashtra, community claims have been given in a community called Mindalika. And if you Google that, you'll find that you've uh, got access to it. But um, how that happened and what, it, uh, what the process and the struggle has been allows the entire movement to take courage from the fact that this is possible and that we need to keep pushing the boundaries with the system, which keeps throwing back the applications to the communities. Yeah. So, um, but we also have another set of neoliberal legislation that's come up on top of this which is the new legislation, uh, the earlier legislation on land acquisition and the legislations on environmental clearances also implicate the forests, you know, because of the way that uh, forests are seen as commodities in the neoliberal paradigm, the forests also become part of that acquisition process for the project of development. <laughs>
And these are also impinging on the rights of uh, communities and their struggles coming together all over the country to claim these rights. Some uh, collaborative, some negotiation, but others that are more militant too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now we're going to uh, Gregor with the issue of seeds and the, the law uh, governing the common seed commons. I wonder if you build upon the examples in India in a way there have been some really fantastic cases of seed banks and also as a result of the fantastic work of Vandana Shiva yeah. and I'm wondering if there's any connection to that if you could, if you could say something maybe mm. about that as, in addition to the law mm. that governs so seeds. The seed bank issue is a, a big issue which it's not so easy as it's always good because there are some problems uh, in the design of these seed banks which I will not discuss yet because it's uh, it's too much time which is needed to uh, yeah, frame all this uh, stuff which is connected to this. But I would like to uh, follow the collective property rights uh, which were mentioned because there is a, I think there is a bridge to the knowledge stream we started uh, tonight here at the conference because in, on intellectual property there is there are huge discussions on collective property rights on uh, um, community property rights since several years which maybe can transferred uh, in some way to the issue of seeds or the issue of land which I take took part in the discussion in the uh, nature stream uh, this afternoon and uh, I think the in the issue of seeds we have a huge international regulation which is quite difficult, quite problematic in the sense that um, intellectual property rights on seeds um, are uh, more and more strong, strengthened and uh, farmers and uh, local communities don't have access to their own seeds even anymore. And uh, there are lots of lawsuits against farmers. And um, But on the other hand, there is uh, a legal structure, or maybe they can, we can adopt a legal structure, an international legal structure with, which is in place already, the International Sea Treaty, where is somehow a common um, touch in it, um, which has to be modified, uh, and the Sea Treaty has to make a clear announcement against patents, which, is, which it doesn't do until now. But uh, it might be possible to use this as a global framework and then start initiatives on the local, or regional, or national le level um, to put seeds in a, in a so let's call it, protected commons. Mm -hmm. I think it's not possible to use, as I did before as well, to use the open source principle on, uh, on seeds, because then the powerful actors will, uh, yeah, will, will uh, try to get the genetic information, the DNA, uh, work with it, breed new seeds, and will and, will, and won't give anything back uh, to the communities or to, to the commons. Um, I have to come back one or two sentences to the land issue we, dis we discussed this afternoon because there was one question which is, I think, really problematically. And this is, when we are talking about commons of land, we, uh, we are against uh, individual property rights yes. on land. But, on the other hand, uh, f farmers' movements like Bier Campesina or and others are in favor of um, land sovereignty. Yeah. So there might be a huge conflict of this common issue on land and the issue of uh, uh, land sovereignty of, um, um, and how to deal with the land issue uh, because Bier Campesina and others are arguing for somehow individual ownership of land in a small scale, not on a big scale, on a small scale uh, that farmers can do their work on these small fields. But it's in uh, contradiction to a common perspective, I think, and we have to think about land ownership in cooperatives or whatever and to see how we can manage the land issue in this way. So, um, in the classic uh, way in which we conduct the Remix the Commons uh, roundtables, we have to ask all of you for one sentence, mm. one sentence that you would choose, 
to describe for you how you would define the commons. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe start over here with the uh, work and then we move mm. down. So one sentence. I think commons is a social interaction between people uh, to manage their life collectively. Okay. Um, the commons is a, a source of sharing, a process that allows you to be in a space that is nurturing, that has trust, and that has sustainability in terms of survival and livelihoods. English. I think commons, uh, it's currently the antidote for the madness of privatizing to the la and commodifying up to the last straw. And I also think uh, is, a fra is a refreshing and a poss possibility for many to reboot they're imaginary because we have lost our even the capacity to imagine and to conceive uh, different ways of relating to each other. I don't think that commoning is easy at all. And I know when we do it in practice, uh, the human nature manifests itself, but I think is the way, the way to go now. I just, just the one okay. sentence. Okay. Uh, uh. This commons for me is a way of thinking and being and organising that recognises I'm completely dependent on you and you're completely dependent on me and that's fun. It's a good dance. The one thing I wanted to say was that commons is also about claiming what, is, what we are losing, what is getting lost. So it's not so much about the property right as the claiming mm -hmm. what has been a means of nurturance and restoration of that. And the commons has always been under enclosure. It's always been in that mm -hmm. embattlement. And I just wanted to make a point to something you said earlier. In Scotland, we've had the Land Reform Act that's followed on from communities regaining ownership of their land. And there's now 500,000 acres back in community land. And there's a whole movement towards community ownership. So that one-way stream we've had of development, to me, is reversing. And that's why I'm very passionate about getting the connections between people in Africa and people in Scotland to actually see how do we do this in both places, rather than just seeing it as something we protect, which we need to in India and Africa or elsewhere, but also how do we restore that? How do we really restore that? And how do we learn both ways in that process? Mm -hmm.